Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. So at six, where does that mindset come from now? This and this is the thing everyone has said to me my whole life. They're like, she's just like, she's an old soul. Like, she's not mm. a little girl. Like, there is some deeper, wise woman soul in there. Like, I'd be able to have heartfelt conversations with people at like six years old and and um understand people's emotions. Like, I'd connect with them and I'd know how they're feeling and ask them why they're feeling that and um. I'd play a lot of like the teaching games where I'm like teaching on the whiteboard and doing my magic hmm. magic spells and playing with my potions and um my Barbie dolls and, and all of that stuff. And um I could see like when I, I could see like when I'd close my eyes, my imagination was so real and I felt like all of that stuff was there, all of the fairies and um all the enchantment stuff like I live this vivid imagination that's why I feel like I always wanted to be an actress when I was younger too I was like I want to be an actress like I want to play dress ups and I want to play in these worlds because I create all these worlds I'm in my mind and um yeah and at the same time like and my family they did take me and my brother like traveling to um not even just like luxury places but like third world places and having a look at how lucky we are to live in Australia and so at a very young age like I was three years old we went to Vanuatu one time and I was like I was bargaining at three years old like speaking like <laughs> like going off to the like shops and then my parents would have to like run after me like just going and doing my own thing and like just this boss woman at three years old and like one of um and yeah, I just became so worldly and just had a look at how seeing people with such happiness when they don't have, you know, a lot and how the Western world and how we get caught up in these petty things and um, how like we don't come back to gratitude and how good we really do have it. And it just gave me that sense of worldliness and gratitude for what I for what I have and a deeper connection to other people and understanding people. Like, I mean, I did a pageant last year, I won my did my first ever pageant one there it was for miss multi let's miss multi i'll show the picture whilst we're there <laughs> i'll this will come onto the screen if anyone's watching but i'm showing a picture of uh <laughs> renee in the uh, competition so um yeah it's on my social media i got my my crown and um yeah i did my first ever pageant and so i'm all for like different cultures and how people live like wanting to understand their perspective how they see the world and what life is like for them, what they believe, like even when I was younger, like that that's something I would do. Like I remember um, like my parents would leave me at kids' club and I would be speaking to everyone as if like I just came in from a past life um, with that same knowledge. And, yeah, it was pretty special. There's me, my little. Oh, oh, whilst we're talking about whilst you're young, I'll show another picture. I know it's, I'm just shoving pictures at the screen, but uh, it's probably a good time to do it. Here's a how how old are you in this picture? Um, I would have had to be four or five. Four, yeah. You look like a four, three, yeah, about a four year old. Yeah. You know, my daughter looks a little bit younger than you mm. there. Yeah, that was me in preschool. <laughs> Amazing. You you clearly very ambitious, um, super ambitious. Where did you get? Where did you get from being super ambitious? You know, I from? my dad. I love love my dad. He's just the most competitive person, and that made me so competitive. And when I was younger, you could never beat dad at anything. He wouldn't take it easy. You know how like parents, they'll take it easy and they'll like let the kids win. Or some people do. Nah. Not you. Some some do. Nah. <laughs> No, 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 no. We we beat we beat my son at Uno, but he's grown to beat us, right? And I don't think he would have grown to beat us if we let him win all the time. There might be a sneaky little one here and there. Exactly. We've let him win. Exactly. But, but 
Dad, yeah, never. And that's what's prepared me. Like, that's what's made me so ambitious today. And with everything, it's like I see a double-edged, like, sword. It's a blessing and a curse because Mm. I really would only feel fulfilled, would only feel successful if I was achieving, if I was getting things, if there was more money in my bank account, I was, like, up-leveling all of that stuff. Like, I put so much of my work in winning uh and like being the best and stuff and not feeling good enough just like as I am and so yeah like you just you couldn't beat him and he would really like when he would win he'd really rub it in your face and stuff and so I became quite a sore loser um for a bit (laughs) and so I um yeah I really feel like how you play games is how you play life. And like, I'm like ruthless in games because that's how I've learned with my dad and coming out on top and winning. And even if like, I don't win, like I'm like, feel it, I feel it. Um, but I'll always get back in the game and I'll always give it a go. Like even went on a cruise, I think for my, for my 21st birthday. And, um, there was a game that dad and I were, were playing 21 and like, I won and I beat him and I got the highest score. And for months, for months, he kept playing that game even long after the cruise. And one day I got a message with the highest score and he got the highest score. And like, and even like, I think a couple of years ago, again, he just sent it out of the blue being like, Hey, remember I've got this high score. Um, and so, yeah, like a very competitive. And so that's where I got my, my ambition and, and my, my dad, he worked very hard, you know, he worked very hard to try and, give us the life that we had and I'm so great like I'm so grateful for my my childhood and my upbringing and um you know they were always doing the best that they can with what they had and my mom she was a stay-at-home mom for a while she's now gone on to start her own aged care business with her business partner and it's really successful now um so I love that for my for my mom and um yeah so they I saw them really work hard into the to the ground and then also because they were working like well, he was working so hard like his his upbringing was not good at all like really really traumatic and toxic and um so we were subjected to quite a bit of that um what was that gambling gambling alcoholism like that's all I knew like as a, a little girl, like there was one moment I remember like this is where I got my independence from. I think I was three or four like probably around that age and we would go up to my dad's dad's place and it was just a weekend of like gambling and um watching the races and and drinking and I just wanted to go to the park I'm a little girl I wanted to go to the park I wanted to play I didn't want to go and just be on device like devices I loved playing outside when I was younger as well good yeah so, most kids that these days are on devices on devices so I um I just found it within myself and jumped the fence as that young little girl walked through the drains, walked past a lake and took myself to the park <laughs> because like they would That's just amazing. ignore me. I'm like, well, I want to go to the park. I'm going to the park. And so I do a lot of things on my own still to this day. And then I remember, I think it was like, I can't remember how long it was. I just remember being on the park on the slippery dip. And um, hearing my name, like, in the distance, I'm like, is that my name? Might have been, like, an hour or something later. But then, yeah, like, family, my parents came and found me. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't trust you after that oh, one. <laughs> no, but they um, they're like, I've got to watch this one. Like, she just does what she wants. <laughs> She's driven. That girl is definitely driven. Driven. She goes after what she wants and she she won't sit. No one puts baby in the corner, like they say in Dirty Dancing. No one puts baby in the corner. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I, I remember that movie. I've forgotten about that movie, actually. <laughs> so it, 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 did this drive, uh, I mean, you were quite young there. What about primary school and high school? How did that drive come through? Come, did it come out in your education? Did you achieve well in your education? Or was you like, nah, I'm not being a part of no, this? No, so in school, I... I was always daydreaming. I was off with the fairies. I was off in my own world. The teachers were always constantly telling me to come back. I didn't, I didn't like, um, fail in school. Like I, I did well. Um, I exceeded in English, like public, like public speaking was, um, everyone's downfall. And that's where I knew how to shine. I'm like, well, this is everyone's downfall. I can really get some big points here. And so I would excel at public speaking. Um, 
and always do really well in in interpreting texts and and in English and um, finding the deeper meanings and writing stories. Like I really did well in that drama and math. I didn't do well in math, so I ended up dropping it in high school. So that's the one thing I didn't do well in. Um, but I was such a talker. Like I always was talking and speaking to people and very much turned into a rebel in my teenage years. Um, real rebel. I feel like the military did straighten me out um, <laughs> big time. How were you a rebel I, in your teenage years? Oh, like I just always caught causing ruckus, like sneaking out, suspended from school. Um, I know I just was really just, it's my way. Like, I, What would you do to get suspended though? Like, you don't come across as a person. I know, like that. I know. I I absolutely know that. Like I'd leave school, I'd back chat, I would question things. Like if like, and that's a big thing. Um, I did lead had a bit of an ego when I first got into the military too, which I'll which that <laughs> that got wiped out mm. of me real quick, which I'll go into. Um, but in yeah, in school, like especially like when they would tell us to do things, like I would question and I wanted to know the purpose. I wanted to know why are we doing like why is this like is this really what we all have to do and we have to just take in just memorize this stuff and then that's that like I wanted to know yeah I wanted to know the purpose of it and, and to challenge things so I was a bit of a, a challenger um and yeah like I um but I would do well I did well in business I took up business and um did really well in business and my teacher really did not like me because like I just wanted to do it my my way and then I would excel and one time she caught me um I was really emotional because I had I think I was going through something at that moment and she's like I've finally broken you down I've broken you down I've got through to you like this is you and I'm just like <laughs> friendly because she can see me now which she probably she probably will one day um but yeah and then like I went I did I was always in sport like always doing the extracurricular activities like um, every time there was like, like the chocolate boxes, you'd go and sell the chocolate boxes. I would do stuff like that, like making money, like instead of just sitting down and having lunch and stuff, I was going around selling the chocolates, raising money. Um, and I, um, I, yeah, was always part of like the sport got nominate, like nominated as one of the best sports persons in school. Um, and I did all, all of the things, every kind of sport I could do, I would do it. I just loved being active. Um, and, uh, the project work, I did project work in Vietnam, which I absolutely love. So even though a bit of a rebel still have a heart of gold, um, but I really, you can tell, yeah, like I really in my teenage years and because of certain things that happened in my childhood, which came out in my teenage years, um, I really protected my heart. Um, and what was that? What came out? What so when I was when I was younger, um, me me and my brother did experience sexual abuse from someone that was close to the family, and I was about three. Um, and I used to have this reoccurring dream of being in a cave, and my parents were jumping on a trampoline, and me and my brother had our heads in these bars, like there was like these like jail bars, and we put our heads through it, and there was like this big doghouse. And like, it was scary. And I got my head out in time of the, the bars, but my brother didn't. And this like beast thing came out and like grabbed my brother. And I used to have this reoccurring dream and I had, yeah. It's a metaphor, isn't it's it? It's a metaphor. And so when, um, yeah. And then I just, I was young and I felt like something didn't feel right as a three-year-old, this person that was very close to my family. I was like, this doesn't feel right. Like something feels wrong here. And I remember speaking up to um, my brother and he was very young and we were told to keep it a secret and um, we couldn't speak up about it. And so when I was like, oh, this is what's happening because my brother, he's young, he didn't know what to do either. Like he needed to protect the secret. Otherwise we were going to get in really bad trouble. And so made me believe that I was wrong and dirty and all of these things for speaking this way in this set about this certain person and um that I was wrong and I shouldn't be dreaming these things and stuff and so it yeah and so I that's my was my first moment of not trusting myself and 
being gaslit and being and like I kind of like shifted like I like my per- I don't the word I don't know whether like I had like that personality shift or something where it's just like oh okay like this isn't happening like or dissociated I dissociated from what was happening um and split off because children don't know like how to deal with something like that and um and then so I just learned that I was wrong and I was dirty and I would even like I was a little girl I was in like kindergarten and and like when I got to my Catholic school I used to think that all these men were like trying to come on to me and I'm a little girl like why would I even be thinking something like that um unless there was something you know that was going on and it um yeah like it came out when we were teenagers like I think that was a big part of my brother's like depression and finding out he was gay as well and um so you lived for 10 years and both of you didn't share it with each other mm. well when I tried to share it with him and I got shut down because he's young as well like we he wanted yeah. he had to protect the secret um and then we just didn't discuss it again and and then it came out when we were teenagers he was the one to speak up and tell my dad and I'll never forget that night and then that those years became a blur like a real blur for me like split up with the family like the, the extended family like so when he told your father did you then jump on and elaborate in that moment yeah because I was like I felt when they told me they saw I wasn't shocked and I was like kind of like I knew it like I knew it Hmm. and I just it was just a I I couldn't believe that it was only just coming out and I think my family they you know it was hard like it was hard for them to handle like they didn't the, the guilt that they would feel about not protecting their children but the thing is when you have someone so close to the family you don't think those things um no and but through it it brought us so close like my family like people look at my family me my brother my mom and my dad and like we're such a close family now you know because we've gone through a lot because of that experience did your tight unit separate from the other unit yeah yes is it still split up to this day yeah because of that yeah and other things too like then my my grandmother like after it all she struggled with cancer and then um uh it came back like she had breast cancer she had her breast taken off and um and then she felt like it was coming back and her doctor was very old I think he was in his 70s to 80s and he misdiagnosed and he missed that she had the cancer came back and so it got on her spine like spinal cancer and it spread throughout her body she ended up becoming a quadriplegic so we um we ended up selling our childhood home because of all of the like my parents just couldn't be in that house because of what happened there and moved in with our our nena at a young age and teenage years and we all were caring for our our grandmother and she ended up passing and then and then it just split she was kind of the glue trying to still keep everyone like together and um and then yeah and then that, that split and stuck with my yeah parents and then my um and then my auntie she she didn't cope like she split from us and she didn't um she really struggled with her mom being gone like nana being gone and she Mm. god it's about three years ago now she passed from suicide and one of my like i say i've got no regrets but the one regret i have in my life is two weeks before it happened I got a message like a strong message like the psychic abilities where it's like you need to go and see your auntie like you need to go see her and it was so strong and I remember telling my family I need to go see her like I'm getting this message it's so strong um and my dad actually the day before she did it saw her at Bunnings like getting getting the tools we haven't seen her in years and my dad saw her and he came home to my mum that night and said god I saw her she looked like a ghost she looked like horrendous and and then we got a call the next night from my mum's brother that yeah she did that 
Mm. I mean, she separated herself because she chose not to, um, I suppose, believe what you guys had gone through. And that's absolutely terrible. But did you, your grandmother, she, you said she was the glue. Uh, did she believe you? Yeah. Oh, they did. They they did. They um. They did believe it all came out and um. What happened to that person? Did anyone did anyone further in that the unit that separated from you? Did they eventually separate from that person as well? On or, or or not? Well, mm, um. And if you're uncomfortable, you don't have to answer anything. Just so you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, because that. Yeah, it was um, because they weren't blood, like they weren't, they weren't blood. Yeah, but one of our blood was, you know, brought them into the family, and that person actually stayed with them, and yeah, still expected us to try and have a relationship with them. Um, yeah, and yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't. So eventually, yeah. From to my knowledge, I know that that my blood is not with that person anymore. Yeah, um, it, and it must be hard for that person, mustn't it? You know, they, somebody that they care and love can't ever fathom <laughs> imagine that they would do that. But you know, I, I think we have three three types of lives in our in our systems we have that secret life that only you know what's going on in your head then you have a private life that only the you know the the person that you with or doing it with or whatever knows it's private and then you've got the public life and i think we all as individuals every single one of us has that yeah you know do you know, do you know what i mean oh, absolutely. so that reminds me of like the japanese concept about the three faces the one that you show the world the one that you're close the one see you and the one that others don't mm -hmm. like there's that actual concept about it um but it's yeah. true, you know, and everyone has their dysfunctions in their families and everyone has these, has certain things potentially, um, but it's all, it's all about how you come out of it and who you become and what you make that mean mm. about yourself and how you turn your mess into your message and alchemize your pain into your power. And I think this is something I said to you about, you know, with your, your ability to connect with people. And that was something that was like, um, you know, you got bullied for it. Um, but it's like your voids become your values, you know, what, what caused you pain or what was missing in your life becomes a value to you yeah. in life. Um, yeah. So, it's, so you, how old were you at that point when everything came out then? I was 13. 13 so um, so you've still got high school to go. Is there anything that we've missed there that you think we should cover? Um, no, I think that pretty much that's what I want to say, like, about it. Yeah. Uh, but the, yeah, it's just life. Like, I, what I, I had equally, it was like I was, as a child, equally living in a fantasy and it was so magical and beautiful, but then equally living in hell and, like, this, mm. this pain and this darkness and this, dirty secret um and you know it, it really then it also showed up like and it, it didn't really like I was so numb to it because I was so dissociated and it was when I started getting into the work and NLP where it actually came out like it was coming up more mm -hmm. where I had to really address it and I had to really own that that you know was part of my journey um and there's parts of me that wish it was dealt in in other ways but you can't go back to the past um and it's about and this is a big part of what goes into my military journey is you know I didn't I tried to speak up when I was little and I got shut down eventually came out and then similar things started happening in the military and I finally spoke up and you know basically like lost my military career over it not lost it where it was taken away from me but I stepped out like I decided to to step out but I'm so proud of myself for stepping up and speaking up because I feel I've paved a new way for women stepping into the military because I went first and copped all the backlash from it. Um, but, you know, they made those changes and, and people, people were served justice. Um, well, I mean, twofold to that, if you didn't, and I know we'll, 
I know we'll go into it a little bit, but your journey into the army, if you didn't stand up for yourself, um, you don't know where you would be now in terms of one, your career of what you're doing, that wouldn't have happened to your mental health could have gone in many, many other directions, right? Whether it would be drugs, alcohol, depression, and so on, you know, you go into that rabbit hole, don't you? Um, so you go into the army, into the military at 17, is that right? And you had your 18th birthday there. I did, I did. So when I was in my teenage, like, years, I knew I wanted to be in the military, I think three years before even going in a train, like, getting my mindset like that. I went to a career expo and because I didn't, I was like, what do I want to do? I know I want to be an actress, but then I was like, you know, told that's not a real job. It's not going to, all of these things. And I believed that stuff. And yeah. um, everyone was wanting to go to uni and I didn't want to go to university. And um, and then I saw the military and I was like, that's something that's been on my mind. I really explored it. And so um, I decided to go into a combat role. I originally wanted to go into intelligence um, because I really love the psychology aspect and human behavior and um, understanding like deeper messages and all of that and but I was like I'll go into the infantry first which is a combat role which is the front line because if I'm going to step into and be an officer and be a leader and giving out orders I want to be able to know what my soldiers are going through or experience and to say that I did the hard yards too especially as being a feminine yeah. woman like you've got to demand that respect you've got to prove your worth like everyone basically does but as a woman like it's um there's extra, it's an extra war you have to go through. And so I, um, the military had to get me a, a personal trainer, like before going in to train me up, which you'll see in that photo that I've got, like how fit and muscly and strong. Shall I do that? Yeah. Now? Like I, is, is it the one with the sign yeah. that you're holding? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to show a picture now. I say, yeah, I'm going to show a couple, I'm going to show a couple of pictures whilst we're on the subject, yeah. but yeah, you, I mean, you look completely different there. Yeah. <laughs> like, like because of the nature of the training like it was blood sweat and tears like the pain that wow. I went through to and I had to to try and keep up with the men like when I went into the infantry um you know I'd have to have creatine I'd have to have like the um supplements to not steroids or anything like that but like muscle recovery to try and keep up because of the strenuous nature of it um and I mean I, I don't mean to be, I don't mean this obviously in any rude way, but it, it just kind of looks like you're photoshopped. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Because you, your face is so feminine mm -hmm. and your body just, I don't know, just looks huge, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Wow. I and mean, it's impressive. I mean, in, it, you must have gone, what, my, my, what I mean by that is you must have gone through, like you say, the blood, sweat, and tears to get to that, right? Oh. I'm just, I'm going to show the, sorry, um, you can continue, but I'm just going to show some, more, a couple more pictures one at a time yeah. of you in there. Do you so, want to just yeah, briefly? This photo here. So once, cause I was one of the very, um, once I went into infantry training, I was one of the first females ever to go through a combat role. Like it was just open to women in the history of the army of combat role. And so that. You look small there. That's the chief of army. So that's a Lieutenant Colonel Angus Campbell and he's the chief of army. And so my section performed the best in our platoon and I was um, to IC or the leader. And so I got to accept the award from the chief of army. And so we started with a platoon of 60, only 18 of us got through. There was 12 women and only two women of like two of us got through. Um, because it was just crazy and they ended up dropping a lot of the standards after us because so many people couldn't get through and women ended up with really bad injuries. A lot of the women ended up on crutches. I should have been on crutches. Like my hips were ruined. I had to do rehab um, on my hips, like after the, the military to learn how to walk without pain again, because it was so painful because our hip placements are very different to male and we're carrying like weights. Like one of the things we had to do was carry 40 kilos of a pack, a big weight, our full webbing, like our armor, our weapon. And we had to trek over 15 kilometers and we had to get it done within like two hours. So I'm practically Jesus. running and it was like, I just, yeah, every night, Kapuka, like, which was recruit training, like, I breezed through that. I had a big ego at Kapuka, like, in recruit training because it was so, I just breezed through and I was the only person, like, everyone would get a TPI, which is basically like a, like a warning or like you've done something wrong, 
we had a platoon. Our, yeah, we had over, I think, 70 people in our platoon. Every single person got a TPI, like they messed up something and got something wrong. So you get a TPI. I was the only person in the platoon that didn't get it. Um, and my corporals and stuff were always trying to break me down because that's what they do. They want to break you down to build you up. And no one could do it. Like no one could do it. Like I had I had a bit of a an, an ego like going in and because like I had, I did a lot of like the training and preparation before going in. So I wasn't just walking in. Like I remember when we rocked up on the buses and they're on the bus screaming, getting us off the bus. And I was like smirking because I'm like, let's go, which wasn't the right mentality to go in. And I remember a bombardier um like was just like you wipe that smirk off your face before I wipe it off you and um so I did have that ego but I did perform really well I um was um and then once I got into infantry I yeah my ego was was wiped and I got broken down big time and when they say I'll wipe that smirk off your face they actually did how well, my, um, when I got there, you know, one of the first females, um, it's infantry. They've never seen females come through that training. And, um, I was in a platoon where a lot of the staff were ex special forces. Like they got stood down from selection or special forces. So they were very bitter, very dirty, um, about that. And they just took it out on my platoon and um yeah and like they there were big investigations that that took place after it and some of them got stood down um and like yeah like my corporal he had the worst case of bipolar like it was just toxic one minute it was like I felt like it was an inappropriate relationship like he was too close and personal with me and the next minute I'm being kicked down a hill and being choked. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.